Are you ready to be amazed? If you like peering into history, if you like exploring a single site and peeling back layer after layer of life through 5,000 years or more, laying bare the homes in Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Pictish, Viking and Scots, then this is the video for you. Because today we're going to Jarlshof and you'd be crazy not to come. So if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me show you some place you'd be crazy to miss. This is Sumbra Head at the very southern tip of Shetland mainland. Now in 1814, Sir Walter Scott visited here and along the coast at that time, he saw a solitary manor house not quite as dilapidated as it is today, but it inspired them to write a novel called The Pirate. Of course, he needed to call the manor house something, and the obvious name was the Earl's Mansion. Shetland, having a uniquely Norse influence, thus was coined the name Jarlshof. Now, a coastal storm around 80 years later showed us that Jarlshof was so much more than just an Earl's house. And that's what I'm going to show you today. That 1890 storm gave just an inkling of what has since been excavated here at Jarlshof. So that what we have now is the most incredible place for anyone interested in history to visit. When Promote Shetland offered to sponsor me to come to tell you what you should come and see in Shetland, I immediately said, this place. If you want to see just how concentrated this site's 5,000 years of history is, then follow the graphic on screen as we walk around. The first time that I came to Shetland, I came here and I'm proper excited to bring you here with me today. Tell me this, what historical sites have most impacted you? Let me know in the comment section. Where I'm standing now was a Neolithic farmhouse. Now we know from pottery found here that people were living in this house and farming here four and a half thousand years ago, around the time that the Great Pyramid was built in Egypt. Sometime before these people or their ancestors had arrived in the pleasant sheltered bay to the west of us. There's fertile land just to the north of us. They ate shellfish from the coastal waters. Now, archaeologists tell us that after a while, they abandoned this site. I don't know why. It was around this time that folk built Stonehenge. Now, this wouldn't have been the first time that folks had to head south for construction jobs. So maybe that was it. But more probably, they left because they had to eat shellfish. Oh. But we know from a hearth and shell remains that folk came back to the same spot, presumably after somebody had invented brune sauce to cover the taste of fish. Archaeologists haven't confirmed this, but... Brune sauce in the bag. This may be the period of the world's greatest scientific invention. Square sausage. But humans had made another, less significant technological step forward. Bronze, which led to a new set of structures here. As the Hittite Empire was on the rise in what we call Turkey, they still farmed the fields around here. But instead of oval-shaped, the houses developed into central hearths surrounded by a number of buttress chambers like this. Apparently, the floor here has been paved several times, so folk had been living here over a long time. The houses were renovated and reused lots of times. Archaeological finds here show us how much folks were trading across the British Isles and Europe beyond. At some point, an entrance was blocked and they put in a new doorway at the opposite end of the building. This was probably around 800 BC when a bronzesmith set up a workshop in this building because they found remains of his hearth and moulds for axe heads. Chisels, crucibles and slag were also found here, but it wasn't all bronze. We also know 
that they were working leather, they were making soapstone and clay pottery, stone ploughshares, cleavers, bone chisels, and you'll never believe this, eating shellfish. As Greeks were inaugurating Olympic Games and Rome was being founded by Romulus and Remus, here they were still eating shellfish with brown sauce. Now we've barely moved geographically, but chronologically we've come through more than 2,000 years of time. You see, in the final years BC, not long after the Parthenon had been established in Athens, the bronze smith here disappeared, but his skills were replaced by new developments in metallurgy. You know what I'm talking about. But the Iron Age also brought a new type of housing as well that you can see here, and some of it slap bang on top of these Bronze Age houses that had gone before. The thick buttresses had been replaced by thinner internal support and walls, leaving more living space. Iron made for stronger tools and weapons for farming, fighting and opening shellfish. Now archaeologists are finding spindle whorls and weaving tools, so presumably clothes are changing from leather to textile. They have more efficient querns for grinding corn and I imagine are more productive in growing techniques. Maybe they've got more time in their hands. As well as sheep and cattle, we now know that they're keeping pigs, small ponies, at Shetland and dogs, and they still fished and hunted for seals and caught birds for food and oil. They carved beads and pendants out of soapstone, but still used bone for tools. In fact, they found a carved whalebone that must have been used in the outer wall as a ring for tethering livestock. Tools were becoming more effective. Things were becoming more efficient. But in some ways, life was becoming more dangerous. They tell me that the site here was abandoned once again. Did they face an outside threat? Were there poor harvests? We're still in the era that's been conveniently named the Iron Age. But as sand covered the houses here, the world outside was clearly changing. And we can see the world changing here at Jarlshof. If you can imagine when Julius Caesar was born, and then as he rampaged through Gaul, then crossed the English Channel to Veni, Vidi and Vici, around the time that the Romans crossed to take Britannia seriously, or seriously take Britannia, at the time folks from Orkney travelled south to submit to Roman power. Around that time, folks were starting to live in larger groups. They were starting to build larger buildings. Now the jury's still out as to whether it was for protection or prestige, but it was around this time that we start to see brochs. And of course, they built one here. Tall, double-skinned towers with stairs and galleries between the two walls. On this trip, we've made a video about the broch at Musa. Now, if you want to see just how impressive a preserved broch looks, then watch that video. But this broch here didn't stand alone. There was a walled courtyard all the way around about it. Now today, about half of the broch and its courtyard have been lost to sea and erosion. But whilst time and tide have taken their toll, this must have been an impressive sight. At some point, somebody then built a roundhouse with an outhouse that sits in the courtyard of the Brock House. It was childish, I know. There are wheelhouses in what was the courtyard and on either side of the Brock. If we go inside, we can get a feel for what it would have been like. Floors were deliberately covered over by clean sand and stone several times. So folks lived here for generation upon generation. Your granny, great granny, your great great granny, and more besides, all living in one place. 
Walls were blocked off, new entrances were constructed, byres were built, but generation upon generation lived out their lives in this place. Excavations tell us that there were people living here from the 1st century BC to the 8th century AD. Through the life and death of Christ, the rise and fall of Rome, the destruction of Pompeii, Christians were tolerated, then persecuted, then Christianity became the religion of the empire. The Pictish hegemony rose, the Saxons crossed the seas, St Columba established Iona, and through it all, folks lived here, eating shellfish. Then, around 800 AD, came the Vikings. Now, folks tend to focus on 795 when Vikings raided Iona, or down south, 793 when they raided Lindisfarne. Of course, the Vikings were here earlier and longer, and completely took over Shetland. Everything that we've seen so far has been round or oval. But by the end of the 9th century, a Norse family had settled here at Jarlshof and built one of their traditional longhouses. They reckon that the original Viking settlement was a farmhouse, a bathhouse, a smithy, servants' quarters and a separate byre. There are remains of seven phases of building down the centuries and across all of this Norse farm village. Houses dating between the 9th and the 13th centuries. When Alapa was formed to the south, this was part of the Norse world that forced Picts and Scots together. When Macbeth defeated Duncan in battle in Murray, his ally Tor and the Mighty held sway in Orkney. When Alexander III of Scotland fought Hookan IV at the Battle of Largs, the people here would have been on the side of Hookan. When Alexander III died, leaving Scotland kingless and Edward I opportunistically invaded, the folks here would have looked on with disinterest. At the very time that they were busy building a new house. They would have been too busy establishing the medieval farm a few yards in this direction. This was a new style of building reflecting a new Norwegian architecture. These buildings were dry stone, but whilst there was no cement, there was an earth core in between the internal and external walls. A bit like cement and cavity wall insulation all built into one. As this medieval farmhouse stands above the original Neolithic farm, it's funny to think how we've come full circle round this site. Now, the original prehistoric farm would have lain beneath sand at this time, and our 14th century farmers probably didn't realise how close they were to the original farmers here. Neither would they be aware of what was to come. You see, in 1469, James III of Scotland married Margaret of Denmark, daughter of King Christian of Denmark and Norway. Now, Daddy Denmark mortgaged Orkney and Shetland in lieu of a dowry. Two years later, when none of the cash had been forthcoming, the Scottish Parliament annexed the islands. I'll be honest, some of the folks here are still a bit upset about that. But trust me, things were worse back then. At this time of the Scottish takeover, Jarlshof belonged to the state of Sir David Sinclair of Sumbra, captain of the palace guard in Bergen, Norway, as well as chief magistrate of Shetland. Lands in the Northern Isles started to be given to relatives of the Stuart monarchs and their favourites, who came north and began to introduce changes. Now, the most notorious of these was Errol Patrick Stuart. His dad had been the illegitimate son of James V, and it was he who built a house here on the summit of this site. But Patrick himself later built an even larger house behind us, leaving dad's creation as a kitchen block. Now, Patrick Stewart was a wrong un. If you're one of those Scots who think bitterly towards the English because of what some individual English baddie did to your people, 
then spare a thought for Shetlanders who look back to what that Scotsman did here. But that's a story for another day. The message for today is come here and visit Jarlshof. To stand here on the very spot that generation upon generation of people have done as different architecture, cultures, languages and belief systems grew one on top of the other, every one of them part of the human story that leads to us. You'd be crazy not to come. There's another place you'd be crazy not to visit coming up on screen now. There'll be no shellfish. In the meantime, how many dog is going to be a lamb alive? Cheerio Andrasta.